So when we get really excited about an innovator um, in the Wired magazine offices, we really go to town. So a few months ago when Richard Branson gave us deep access to Virgin Galactic, what we thought was going to be an eight-page feature became a 24-page feature. And we're working with um, one of the speakers you're going to be lucky enough to hear after the break, Thomas Heatherwick, on a project that's going to be big in a couple of months. Um, but not all the innovators are big names. About 18 months ago, we came across an academic who was below the radar. He'd had about 400 academic papers published, about 40, 700 papers, I think, about 40 patents in kind of bioengineering and semiconductors and healthcare. Um, and he was doing work that was really intriguing us because of its possibilities. He was based at Imperial College London, running the Institute of Biomedical Engineering. He had various spin-off businesses like Tumaz Technology and DNA Electronics. Um, but it was the work he was doing to use sensors to track the signals coming out of our body that we thought could be transformative. And he's here now to explain a bit more about this. Please welcome Professor Christopher Tumazu. An engineer with my little bits and pieces there. Okay. It's so important to get that interdisciplinarity, that, that sort of mix between the engineers and the medics. And never before has the merge between engineering and medicine been so strong. It's absolutely fascinating. And we're entering a fantastic new wave of technology now, inspired by healthcare. People are living longer. You know, soon there'll be more over 65s than under 16s. For every five minutes, I talk, you will all live by an extra second. So I'm going to give you three seconds of life after this presentation. So that, at least that's something out of this presentation. So I'm a bit of an imposter because I don't know much about medical technology. I mean, I work with medics, I try and learn their language, but my field is this technology. I've been de designing semiconductors, microchips for mobile phones for many, many, many years. And this whole application of microchip technology is fascinating because we've evolved from big machines into small devices like that using semiconductor chips. For consumer applications, a fantastic application domain. But about 10, 12 years ago, I applied a fraction of this technology to healthcare and we created the world's first totally implantable cochlear prosthetic for born deaf children. I didn't use digital technology. I modelled the technology on the way biology worked. I modelled the cochlea out of a silicon chip, out of the physics of the silicon chip. Because I think we're doing things all wrong. We're graduating engineers with flat fingers and ones and zeros pouring out of their ears. But we're forgetting the fact that biology is still analogue. And what I've been able to do is create a cochlear prosthetic. Now several thousand born deaf children can hear as a result of this prosthetic. And it's not a big digital processing chip outside of the head. This is something that was created in the language of biology, the language that biology understands. And that's really the paradigm shift, the drive. Now we have got huge problems. How do we apply that technology to these problems? It's not just a US problem, obesity, type 1, type 2 diabetes. We're seeing this, sedentary lifestyles, um, all sorts of chronic disease and chronic disease management. I mean, it's a huge cost to the system. How do we use these technologies to combat this problem? The sad thing with all this innovation, chronic disease management is still pretty primitive. This is state of the art in a home setting. I mean, look at this slide. I mean, <laughs> In fact, I, I showed this slide about a week ago and a member of the audience spotted, and I didn't, saw it for the first time actually, that there's an ashtray there <laughs> and there's a cigarette butt. But the more sort of strange thing, it's not even his hand but that's by the ashtray, so I don't know where this slide came from, but it was just to demonstrate <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the technology. The nice thing is that we're seeing now with GE and all the big companies like Medtronic and Roche, there's this whole invigoration in sensor technology. We're seeing all these sensors, loads of fantastic sensors. The problem is a lot of these sensors are unintelligent. It's back to the sort of McCarran type uh, drive. 
you know, what we, what, what we need to be doing is to bring intelligence. It's all about interpretation. We've got too much genetic data. We're, we're, we're sequencing too many genomes. We're understanding disease. That's absolutely fine. But it's all about interpretation. That's where the issue is. It's understanding that information. So if we look at this paradigm, I've applied what my mobile wireless technology to healthcare. But as I said, my contention is that the bio world is analog. Speech, sound, sight are all analog signals. If, if speech were digital, I'd be shouting or not shouting. So we're not digital, okay? Yet we try and interface this digital world to this bio system. And this is where I think we need to start thinking slightly differently about interpretation and medical technology. Take, for example, sort of a <laughs> lifestyle, not chronic disease management, but lifestyle management. Just imagine that, that you've got a, a future where there's loads of sensors on the body measuring cardiac information, accelerometry, exercise, etc. And then you just imagine a situation where all that unintelligent data is being sent off to some mainframe or some back-end cloud computer. You're talking about, just for one individual, over 600 megabytes of data per hour. If you imagine a chronic disease population, just a small chronic disease population, that's hundreds of petabytes. A petabyte is 10 to the 6 gigabytes. So the entire capacity of Google, just for one population, if you're sending or extracting all this unintelligent data. But that's the way things seem to be going. So why that paradigm? Well, if you remember the days of the dumb mainframe, sorry, the dumb computer and the mainframe, the mainframe was the intelligent device, and the dumb computer or the dumb sort of terminal was the thing that you'd program on. But then what we did, the revolution brought that mainframe to the computer. The intelligence was then brought to the computer, and the microchip industry enabled that to happen. And we created the PC. The PC then led to the laptop and the smartphones and all the great things that we've created. Now what we're doing is we're taking the guts or the hard disk out of these devices, chucking them to a thing called the cloud, and these things are becoming browsers, called browsers. In biology, we're still at the mainframe. We haven't moved. And this is the point. We need to create the biological IP address, not the digital IP address. Now, I'll show you some practical problem, uh, issue. I'm not going to go, I was going to go through some physics, but I better stop. I know I'm a professor, but I think that's the limit of what I can show. But I want to show you this slide. Spot the monkey. <laughs> there could be other faces on there, but I daren't put them on today. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I hope you spot that monkey, spotted the monkey instantaneously. Did you spot the monkey? Okay. Well, the, the point of that slide was actually the best digital computer on the planet could not have spotted that monkey instantaneously. No way, with all its processing power. Because the visual system, the retina, which is the only part of the brain that sticks out of the head, accesses, stores and ships out large quantities of information instantaneously. Yet, the brain of a common housefly, smaller than a grain of rice, could have done it instantaneously. Why? Because what's beautiful about biology is we have local intelligence. We take big, big, large bandwidths of information, we compress it, we do the intelligence locally on pixels, and then we ship out low bandwidth information. That's how we should be creating our devices. So the first device I created several years ago was a thing called a digital plaster. Now, this digital plaster is actually an ECG monitor. It's got a chip which I call the Sensium and not a Pentium. This Sensium actually sits on the chest and it's camouflaged behind a, pla a, a patch or a, a, a band-aid, as the Americans like to call it, or a plaster. And effectively, what this does is it measures your full ECG, your heart rate, your respiration rate, your respiratory movement, and also your accelero accelerometry, all in real time, 24-7. And it sends it via a low-power radio to an end system or to an iPhone, and it's doing it 24, and it's disposable. It's disposable, it's using a microchip. And the important thing about this technology, it becomes preventative medicine. We did all the clinical trials in the UK. 
More than several thousand patients now in major hospitals are wearing this device. At St. John's in Los Angeles, the whole uh, normal ward in the hospital, patients are wearing this. When they get into the hospital, they put this patch on. Why? Because it's early detection. If, a, if you can save a patient from going into intensive care wards, or if you can discharge a patient sooner rather than later, then that's a great cost saving to the system, but also to healthcare. It's amazing because you can protect, it's all about preventative medicine. The patch goes onto the chest and then it can continuously monitor. Now, metabolic disease. On the left, this child, it's a hundred year old, this slide, by the way, or not this slide, this photograph. This child has type one diabetes. And he was given insulin, one of the first children ever given insulin. And on the right, that's that same child. Looking pretty healthy, right? But what you don't see, that child has got no legs. He's lost his legs through hyperglycemia. Meaning that insulin was only secre is only secreted whenever you take your glucose levels. Most of the time, you're outside of that continuous range where you want insulin. Digital is not continuous. Analog is con continuous. That's why biology is continuous. What we should be creating is a system that models the way the pancreas works. And if you look how primitive technology is, in 1933, Wellcome came up with the first sort of insulin packaging, the first syringe that secretes insulin and a glucose monitor. To the right, in 2011, you see the same technology. The only difference is the packaging. Nothing's, nothing's changed over all those years, just the packaging. Because where the big bottleneck is, is ensuring continuous monitoring. We know the problem. So several years ago, I got together with a few medics at Imperial College, and we created an artificial pancreas. We took the way the pancreas works, the beta and alpha cells, we modeled those chips out of a semiconductor, we modeled the behavior of the pancreas, and we created a chip. And that chip, we're working with Medtronic, which is a big, big medical device company, Roche, in, Ger in, in, in um, Switzerland. And we've taken our chip and we put the chip inside a, uh, an insulin pump. We've got a glucose sensor, an insulin pump that all sits on the peritoneum here. It's closed loop. The intelligence is the chip that combines the two things together, and insulin is secreted now on a 24-7 basis, intelligently in the way physiology does it. And the whole idea is to mimic exactly the same way as the beta cells mimic the secretion of insulin in, in the real biology. We have done our clinical trials at the Hammersmith Hospital. Today, more than 20 people are wearing this technology. And last but not least, I'll move on to the last subject because I've got a few slides. I can see that David's standing up there. Let me, let me just finish off on this slide. We've talked about chronic disease management. We've talked about therapy. We've talked about diagnostics. But the future for me is all about early detection and genetics. And several years ago, we invented a way of switching on and off semiconductors with DNA. And that seems to have revolutionized this industry now because if I just move on to this slide here... This industry now is enabling PC-type devices to sequence now almost a $1,000 genome. But where I see the future is putting this whole thing on something like this. So this chip here, just to finish off, I can take your saliva today, and in 15 to 20 minutes, I can extract your DNA onto a microchip. I can put that DNA into a USB stick, and I can tell you any disease propensity you might have, I can tell you whether you can metabolize a particular drug or not. And I can even give you predisposition to all sorts of genetic diseases very rapidly on a USB stick using microchip technology. So for me, the future is all about interdisciplinarity. And I think the future's already arrived. It's just not evenly distributed. And I think the whole point is to get people to work together. Thank you very much. <laughs>